Hi guys, and welcome to Language of the Soul podcast, where life is story. I'm your host, author Dominic Domingo, and I'd like to say a quick hello to our producer extraordinaire, Virginia, who is going to get the same title she was given this morning because we're shooting two episodes back to back, or recording two episodes back to back. You are still the overdue Valentine nail lady. Yes, I am. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to relitigate the nails. <laughs> no, I'm not going to. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll put a picture in the show notes. Yes, I can. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for being here for our second episode of the day. And then, uh, again, before we introduce today's guest, who is patiently waiting in the green room, I'd like to make a few announcements that I never seem to quite fit in. Uh, usually, I say, hey, check out the YouTube channel, and I'm going to say it again. There's a lot of supplemental content that hopefully you'll find inspiring, and be sure to like it and subscribe. That'll really help us grow our platform. Secondly, um, we are in the top 50% of podcasts. I'm really speeding this up, but uh, based on our downloads and our stats, uh, after only two and a half months, we are in the top 50%. So thank you to our amazing guests, including today's, and for our listeners. So thank you, especially to those who have tuned in regularly. Uh, be sure to subscribe or um, follow us, though, because then you'll get updates on when we've dropped a new episode. Okay, and then as always, there's a little heart at the bottom of every episode that says support. To help us reach a larger audience and a larger listenership, uh, we've got to promote. So please consider giving a one-time donation or a monthly commitment, however big or small, and both those options you will find by hitting that heart that says support. Okay, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. And now, by way of introduction, I'm going to read today's guest's bio. Ted, if I bought you, this is your opportunity to set me straight on anything I might have gotten wrong. Okay, Ted Young is a college administrator and professor. He received his PhD in Romance Languages and Literature from Harvard University. No small thing. His MA in Spanish and Portuguese from UC Santa Barbara and his BA in English and Portuguese also from UCSB. He's published a book in Portuguese on a 2,600-page Brazilian historical novel co-edited the book a Twice Told Tale, Reinventing the Old World, New World Encounter in Latin American Literature and Film, and has published numerous papers and delivered lectures nationally and internationally on topics including literature, film studies, which I would love to talk about with you, Latin American and foreign language studies, and issues of race and cultural identity. His most recent book chapter is The Role of Community Colleges in Liberal Arts Education and From the Desk of the Dean, the History and Future of Arts and Sciences Education. Ted has worked at UCSB, Harvard, UCLA, FIU, and Pasadena City College. Currently, he is Associate Provost at Art Center College of Design, and that's where our paths crossed. All right, Ted, what did I get right and what did I get wrong? That That's, that's in a nutshell. That, that's pretty good. All right. Sounds like you. Okay. Sounds sounds like the version of me that is in academia. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. You have mentioned it was a temporary stop at one point, but you found yourself, right, still in academia at Art Center. So by way of sort of dipping a toe in the water, I would love to hear about what led, led you to literature in the first place and then how that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seemed like it was a bit of a tangent for you to go the academic route is that fair to say well it, it's more let's see i'll back up high school um i came out of high school planning on being an attorney um i loved literature uh, i became i declared english major as an undergrad because i was told that's a good major if you're going to be an attorney and that's what i thought i wanted to do um I, my, my wife is an attorney, and so she's sick of hearing me make this joke or make this comment that I realized pretty soon into college that I, I felt like I'm too ethical to be an attorney. <laughs> well, maybe a defense attorney. Is she a defense attorney? Or? Yes, she is. Criminal defense. Okay, well, um, and that's is she a whole... a, an ambulance chaser? No, no, definitely not. And she used to do civil litigation, mm -hmm. large large law firm, huge, uh, huge cases um, as one of, you know, a, a team of a, a giant team of, of attorneys, uh, like uh, representing Citibank in the Enron 
Mm, is, wow. you know, their, their, their slice was about a billion dollars, uh, billion with a B. So she did that. And then she ended up moving into, uh, she went to a smaller firm and got into uh, criminal defense. And she likes to say that, that uh, the people she represents now are not as criminal as the people she used to represent. <laughs> right. There's probably some truth right. to that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So well, that's, that sounds uh, perfectly commendable. I think these are just yeah. tropes, right? But yeah. well, I mean, to, to 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 sort of hone in on, I think your point. What do you mean exactly by too ethical to become an attorney? Well, how did that lead you to literature? Well, so that led me to to give up on the idea of law. And at the same time, as an English major, I was studying a lot of literature, and and I'd had great literature teachers in high school, and and I just loved literature, and it was kind of um, inertia, frankly, mm. that that kept me doing that. I also I had lived in Brazil in high school, and I wanted to go back, um, and the education abroad program uh, at at University of California, you know, they had a program in Brazil, and I wanted to go on that program, so I mm. was taking Portuguese classes, and that becomes literature after you after you the first the first two years are you know, about you know language and then writing but then you study literature and i entered immediately i already spoke portuguese so they put me in the lit courses and i just got more and more caught up in it and and you know i i love reading literature i love teaching literature um on the side the 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 part of my life that's not within academia i, I like writing my own literature mm. um did you learn Portuguese in the home, or why did you already know it? I I lived in Brazil. I, I had heard um, I heard Spanish growing up from my mom's family, and it's very similar to Portuguese. So I I it didn't Portuguese didn't sound so foreign to me. I was going to say I I speak French. I was smart enough to learn it as an adult. Right, considering language skills peak at seven, I mm -hmm. got the brilliant idea to learn French at Disney as an adult. And uh, when I hear Portuguese, I get excited because, of course, il n'y a personne avec qui pratique mon français. <laughs> there is no one in Los Angeles with whom to practice my French. Yeah. But then I, it takes me a few seconds. I go, nope, that's Portuguese, and it's Spanish and French in a blender, basically. <laughs> there are there are there are particular uh, phonemes in exactly. in Portuguese that are very similar to French. Yep. There are there's some vocabulary um, that. For the most part, Portuguese and Spanish are mm -hmm. much closer. They evolved together along with other Iberian languages. Um, but there are a few things like the, the word for street in Portuguese is rua, R U A. Yeah. Right. right. You know, it's not mm -hmm. something that sounds like calle in Spanish, right. <clears throat> um, or you know, via in, in Italian or something like that. It it's it's different. So you you get that, and I've heard that many times from people where they'll hear, especially Brazilian Portuguese, mm -hmm, yep. and and think, oh, mm -hmm. that sounds like French influence. My ears prick every time, and I just think they're out to confuse me. <laughs> you all are out to confuse me. Yeah, but it, it yeah. So I I had that uh, particular aptitude familiarity with phonemes even if it was a passive familiarity growing up i didn't i did not speak spanish growing up um but my mom did she she grew up bilingually and uh had an opportunity to be an exchange student in brazil in high school mm -hmm. so i went down there and loved it um created an amazing bond the year before my sister had lived with a family and a boy from the family lived with us and then that family invited me to come stay with them the next year so i stayed with the same family that my sister had been with. And, and my Brazilian brother, who had lived here in the States with us, was my Brazilian brother when I lived in Brazil then. He and, <laughs> nice. and, and two other brothers and a sister. And it's it's a bond that we, I mean, that was in 1977, mm -hmm. and we're in touch continually, more nice. than daily, wow. more than daily, <clears throat> multiple times a day with the family, with um, the guys I went to school with down there in high school, um, you know, we're, we have different WhatsApp groups and, and <laughs> we just, we communicate all the time. Um, the, the I, my different Brazilian nephews and nieces have been to the States and a couple of the nieces lived with us here. Um, I used to go to Brazil. Well, I lived there that first time I lived there 
in, during undergrad. Um, I lived there between undergrad and master's. And then I would go back, once I became a professor, I would spend three to four months out of the year, every single year in Brazil. So I, I was there continually. And yeah, that's, it's, it's my second home and, and you know, it's, it is my second language, but I mean, I wrote my, my doctoral dissertation in Portuguese. Right. I'm, I'm blown away by that. So it's clearly in the blood. It, it's definitely a part of, of who I am in a big way. And, and mm -hmm. it informed my career up until I, I became, well, really up until I came to Art Center. Um, mm -hmm. Even my previous job before Art Center as a dean at Pasadena City College, uh, it was the a newly formed languages division. And so having a background um, teaching language and literature, the foreign language and foreign, foreign language literature, that was a, a qualification for that job. So there was a direct right. relationship there. This is definitely a tangent, but um, I'm sure you know, at Art Center, a lot of the students get their general ed at Pasadena City College. Did you happen to run into any of those former students from PCC at Art Center? I, I probably have seen them, but at Art Center, I don't deal with, with students very often. You know, oh, I see. Right, I, right. The only time I, I really deal with students is when there's a problem. It's <laughs> right. really unfortunate. <laughs> right, right. Um, but there, there are faculty members or several faculty members at Art Center that I know from PCC. Right. Yeah, I just, well, and now Art Center more and more is actually recruiting straight out of high school. Mm -hmm. It used to be, even when I went there from 89 to 91, they were like, yeah, why don't you go get your general ed and grow up a little bit? <laughs> and then, you know, consider coming here. But younger every day. And PCC is a great school, isn't it? Yeah, as, as a, a community great college. college. Yeah. Um, you know, it always, I, I haven't checked the, the the rankings lately, but it was always really high up in the rankings for community colleges. And, and yeah. overall, I mean, I think the community college system is just an, an amazing social mechanism to be able to bring education, post-secondary education, mm -hmm. to, to a much larger population than in, in most any other place I know of. Of course. Do you see it ever being free? Well, it used to be. You know, when I, when well, I was a $50, kid. Yeah, it was $50 a uh, term when I went, regardless of how many units you took. Yeah. I think yeah, it's gone they, up. They, they added that. It's gone up a lot more than that. But, you know, that's something that, that I think would be very helpful to have. You know, that would increase opportunity. Part, one of the drawbacks is community colleges in California tend to be over-enrolled. Um, there's not enough room for all the students who are there. Uh, anybody, if you apply, you're admitted. There's not a selection process to right, get in, right. but you have to find classes. They need to be mm -hmm. available. Right. And that was always a huge problem in, in the, oh, was about a dozen years I was a dean. Um, we, we just never could have enough classes available for, for the demand, the student demand, because mm -hmm. the budget's determined by the state. And that translates into numbers of sections you can offer. Right. So, yeah, maybe... I'm just trying to figure out if you're a socialist or not. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a Bernie or Dyer. Uh, anyway, I want to really start out here by dipping a toe in the water, very much in the spirit of this podcast. So I wrote down a couple questions. Some of them are based on your prompts. But I immediately, considering you're an academic and just my opinion, but I've I've kind of noticed especially with literature, my, my um, nephew studied French literature. And I just think there can, of course, be an elitist attitude toward pop culture, even cinema. And I was pleasantly surprised that you had studied film studies as well. So my question is this, you know, my book, as you probably already know, and this podcast are just about storytelling in general. And that encompasses all formats and genres. And I would even be so bold as to say since right oral tradition around the campfire throughout human history. So my question to you is, do you see an overarching function of storytelling in culture or an overarching role that it has? Um, I, mean, I think it's the most fundamental aspect of human communication. <laughs> is I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that could be emphasized enough. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an incredible work by Hayden White. He's one of the founders of the new historicism. Mm -hmm. um, and he he has an example of 
he takes a definition of of uh, narrative of story uh, from Todorov and and somebody else, Svetlana Todorov and somebody else. But the different kinds, the elements that are necessary, and then he shows these these chronicles um, from uh, early medieval um, what's now Germany, the 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 annals of uh something a saint somebody i forget which saint but it's it's a list of dates and mm-hmm. major occurrences so you mm-hmm. have the year you know 680 flood um 690 um giant fire um and and like that this battle mm-hmm. that battle mm-hmm. just, just things like that <clears throat> and it's it's important data and understanding things, but you don't get any of the connections. You just become mm-hmm. aware of particular events that the chroniclers, whoever they were over time, felt were important. Mm-hmm. So you'll see that there was, you know, a king died, another king came to the throne. There was a battle someplace. There was a plague. There was this, there was that. Mm-hmm. No connections are made. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no greater meaning mm-hmm. to it. You, you, you don't understand the you you have to guess at what the meaning might be for the people of the time. Right. There was a war. Okay, we can imagine what happened, mm-hmm. but we don't have that detailed information. Did they win? Did they lose? Did it you know wipe out half the population? Mm-hmm. What's missing is the narrative, is the story, right? That connecting tissue mm-hmm. that makes it meaningful for human existence. Love it. Yep. Yeah, and, my mom used to really. There was speaking of junior college, uh, L.A. Valley College. Uh, there was a really great art history instructor, and do you, and I'm an artist, so numbers don't stick for me. <laughs> I've joked like history doesn't stick because I don't understand war in the first place, and studying history is largely studying war, you know. And so nothing ever stuck. But the minute I learned philosophy for dummies in my 30s at art at a uh, Disney, I just started reading in the gym, and suddenly everything clicked because you could explain world events, you know according to the overriding philosophy on the planet at any given time. Of course, there's the Western European, you know, Judeo-Christian tradition, and there's Eastern ones, but largely there seems to be a cutting edge that explains all world events. But anyway, this one art history instructor at LA Valley College, my mom loved him because he would just tell you the dirt. Like, you know, here's what Brunelleschi or, you know, whoever, this is what... Michelangelo did to get this commission and suddenly it kind of stuck. You're kind of hinting at another prompt that I have here. My book is largely about the micro and the macro. Storytelling serves both patron and artist on the micro level, but then by extension, hopefully evolves society. So the catharsis by consuming storytelling is largely what I call transformation. And then by extension, through the ripple effect, one hopes policy, right? The noosphere is a, is ultimately affected, and I call that evolution. So with that premise, I point out in the book that the word for history is l'histoire. It's the same. Story and history are the same word. So I noticed you kind of hinted that in that in your form. What is the connection, in your opinion, between story and history? You kind of hinted at that, that it fills in the gaps and explains the significance of the world events, but is there more to it than that? Well, the, the point that Hayden White is making is that history is the story, mm-hmm. and there are histories. Mm-hmm. There's no one capital H history. Um, he, he gives many examples of the, the, the selection. Basically, you say any, any history is, is, in a way, a work of fiction. Right, right. Even if you're using actual facts that are true, mm-hmm. It's the ones, the facts you choose to include and the ones you choose to exclude exactly. create a narrative. Yep. Um, and that's an editorial a, choice to include or exclude, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. A- and um, they, there's a really interesting exercise. Um, I could read it for you. There's, It's two paragraphs. Do it. Okay, I will. <laughs> um, We're all about exercise. Because I'm, because, well, if, if, yeah, if I, if I explain the thing in advance, then, then it loses the impact. So how quickly there, are you going to find it though? That's the question. Look I at have, all those I books. Have, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go dig through the shelf. I think I see Darth Vader behind you. 
You do. Speaking of 1977, by the way, yeah. that was the year Star Wars came out, and it was yep. made for me, by the way. I was nine years old. <laughs> you were 15 in uh, Brazil, right? Um, I wasn't in Brazil when it came out. Um, I, I went to Brazil soon after it came out, and but I saw it in theaters, and we can... That's another rabbit hole if you want to go down that and talk, <laughs> talk about, you know, the whole... The, the, the hero's, hero's journey. I, right, so right. I used to teach a, a summer class at FIU, the film studies. It was uh, sci-fi fantasy film. And um, I looked at issues of genre, but but when I dealt, I dealt with what was then, um, it was the, the original trilogy of Star Wars and then episode mm -hmm. one. That's all mm -hmm. that was out. But looking at, at you know, the hero tradition, not not just mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell, but his, his sources. Right. Um, but that's a, well, while you're looking for the exercise, oh, I, I, I have it. You have it, okay? Yeah. You no, know, that we definitely need to go back there because uh, we—it's all interrelated. But we had a guest who was very passionate about telling the stories of the marginalized, the regional stories that are not part of patriarchy or you know the Judeo-Christian Western European tradition. And yes, it's time we told those stories of those who have been silenced, right? But she. Uh, you remember this, Virginia, was mm -hmm. was pretty kind of a rebel without a cause. You know, when I would talk about universality or sort of any comparative religion tradition like Joseph Campbell's concept of the masks of God or, you know, she was like, oh, well, that's just another tool of the patriarchy to oppress and silence. So where do you go from there, <laughs> right? If there's nothing universal in, about the human condition available to us through storytelling, where do you go from there? I know there's a lot more nuance to it than that, but well, let's come back to that. I'm kind of intrigued by your exercise. Did that make okay, any sense I, to you at all though? Oh, like, Oh, it did. Yeah. Some people, the hero's okay. journey makes their, the first stand up on their neck because it's just another form of patriarchy. And, yeah. you know, I walked away thinking, well, then you really don't understand the template because it's about all of us. It has nothing to do with any one institution or certainly not patriarchy. But that was just my knee-jerk reaction to that. We definitely okay. should come back to that. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, once there was a man who fought in a war that his country lost. He returned home to a devastated community. The imperialist powers that had defeated his country imposed extreme economic controls on the losing nation in order to maintain those people under control and at the same time steal their wealth. He felt frustrated by his personal condition and by the extreme economic hardship all around him. He banded together with others who felt equally victimized, calling for social and political change. He joined the Socialist Party and became, an, and became active in street protests and demonstrations against the elites who ran the country. Eventually, he was arrested for his part in the protests and spent time in prison. When he was released, he helped to better organize the party and get members elected to Congress. Because of the way they championed the cause of the displaced, they gained a majority in the government, and this leader became chancellor. He led initiatives to nationalize many sectors of the economy, revitalize depressed industries, get blue-collar workers fully employed, created social structures to incorporate all sectors of society, and overhauled education under a strength. He sounds great. Industry. He sounds like a really great guy. The country prospered greatly, economic inequalities lessened greatly, and the people hailed the leader for freeing the country from the tyranny of imperialist oppression. He was a hero. With Next a great paragraph. mustache. Yes. <laughs> once, once, there, once there was a man who fought in a war that his country lost. He returned home psychologically scarred, with exacerbate, which exacerbated his previous, in, previous instability. He cultivated his hatred for those he saw as different, dirty, and guilty of betraying the country. He joined with others who thought like he did and formed street mobs that harassed and bullied those who didn't agree with them. They staged a violent riot, and many were arrested, including this man. During his time in prison, this man planned his strategy to impose his ideas on the country. When he was released, he and those like him organized across the country to dominate elections through misinformation and coercion with an eye toward seizing political power. They fomented racial hatred and brutality. Through the spread of their ideas and intimidation, they were able to control the Congress. Once they had a majority, this leader became chancellor. He created agencies that took control over industry and education. He instituted extreme censorship and a secret police to squash all opposition. 
He violated international borders and waged war on all his neighboring nations. In his homeland and throughout the conquered territories, he imprisoned, tortured, and murdered millions of people as part of his plan to purge the world of undesirables. This man was evil. And of course, both histories are true, and both are the same man. Right, right. Yep. It's yeah. fascinating. I, I, I like that because as you guys were talking about everything, too, it made me think of like, you know, when someone writes a personal um, narrative, it's mm -hmm. from their perspective. And so it's how they view it at that time, depending on what their vantage point is. Mm -hmm. So that's really right. And and what when I first and, and this I, I reconstructed this a while back, actually, I wanted to share it with my kids. I've told them it, but I, I found that the this version that I reconstructed. When I first saw this, and I'm reading through it, and I, I at first I thought that the first person was Che Guevara. Mm. And then I then I get to the part mm. of Chancellor and stuff, like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then I get to the other one, like, oh, that's Hitler. Right, well, yeah. Chancellor was the big giveaway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You didn't I, mention that he was a frustrated art student, though. No, I that. didn't, I didn't. I, I, <laughs> you, you left know, that out. <laughs> I should have put that in there. That, that's, that, but, that's the right. crux of the whole yeah. no. But the, the <laughs> whole idea that you can have such radically different views of somebody right using it's 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 the facts that you choose and then a little bit the way you say it right that's yeah. kind of what i what i keyed into is you can tell any story through any lens right the editorial choices of what to include and what not to right the very subject matter or premise that you choose to share but then there's the nuances of word choice, right? Everything's got a connotation. Or a language is not an exact science. Everything's got a culturally relative connotation and denotation. So yeah, every single word choice paints a picture. But in a more broad sense, and this has been coming up a lot too, is like, where is the universal? Philosophically, some people believe there is what I call universal truth or objective reality. And others would say, no, there's nothing but the subjective reality <laughs> based on the way our brains reify information, our biases, right? Our past experiences, those goggles we all wear. So in human resources, people would say, oh, the objective reality, the ultimate truth is consensus. Other people would say, well, God sees all, right? So <laughs> God's omniscient and God knows the truth. Do you believe there is some kind of ultimate truth? Or is it all subjectivity? So I'll answer that referring to another school of literary theory, uh, reader response criticism. <clears throat> the idea is that if, if you have a particular literary work, um, that work, you can't, you can't step in the same river twice. Mm -hmm. You can't read the same book twice. You, because every, you've changed and grown the second time you read it, or yes, you you have a different experience. Mm -hmm. So there used to be is really common to look for the meaning right. of a work of literature, mm -hmm. and that meaning might have been the author's intent, or right. it might be the meaning within a particular historical context, and that's the true meaning. Mm -hmm. um, with reader response criticism, it it's the meaning is what you as an individual get from it right it's your real response quick it is reader response criticism is that what you called it reader response criticism yeah. Yeah. is that part of the the new criticism movement does that click for you that which which says the artist's intentions yeah. are secondary it, it, and it's the projections of the patron right. that matter mm -hmm. yes yes yeah i agree with that uh, and i will go on to say as a writer when i read not even liturgy but like literary criticism I think oh, that's all projection. The art, and I I like to think I'm in touch with right how writers think. So I'm like, well, and this does speak to something that's hopefully going to come up later that you mentioned in your prompts. Historical fiction. A lot of times, it's just the setting. It's a character-driven story about either the inner workings of the human heart or the human condition in general. And the setting is the best way to support that thematic content, right? But literary criticism will often put that the cart before the horse and put a little too much emphasis, in my opinion, on the meaning behind the particular war that's really just a backdrop. Like I'm thinking of obviously Gone with the Wind at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's largely a human story about, you know, the, the human heart and loss and all these really profound themes. But it is really just a setting. 
Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned Gone with the Wind specifically. Um, my wife and I were talking with with our kids over the, over the winter break and then with a, another friend about Gone with the Wind specifically. And, and mm -hmm. um, my wife loves a novel, loves a movie. She sees it, and she used to only see it as the story of a strong woman mm -hmm. who overcomes all the adversity and will not be kept down and, right. and is triumphant. And right. she loves stories about badass women. That's that <laughs> right, you know, right. she relates to that, you know. <laughs> and so that's all she saw in it. Mm -hmm. And I remember that my first impression of that movie when I was a kid, and I saw it and mm -hmm. I saw it in theaters when it was re-released sometime in the in the in the 70s. And for me, the focus was a love story. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's about mm -hmm. this love story and and the ways in which these two main characters get together and don't get together. And, and, and that is the, the crux of it. Mm -hmm. But then later as an adult, I looked at it as, wait, this is about the civil war. This is about people who are <laughs> right, trying, right. trying to maintain uh, an oppressive society. You know, they want to keep slavery in place. Um, and, and, and also, you know, a, a, a knee jerk reaction, like what that's the South. They lost, they were wrong. Slavery is evil. They are all bad guys. Mm -hmm. So how could this be a nice story? You know, like that. And I came to realize Gone with the Wind is all of that. It's exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's what I heard. I was about to jump in and say it is all of that under the umbrella, maybe, of survival, right? Surviving loss and reinventing and, you know, people handle it differently. And so in that way, I would say war is the go-to trope for Moral ambiguity, if that makes sense, because all bets are off. When I hear terms like the ethics of war, I'm like, I'm sorry, that's a contradiction in terms, right? So it's almost that Lord of the Flies where anything goes and what place do ethics really have when everybody's in survival mode, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, ethics of war, it's it's like rules of engagement. So Nuremberg <laughs> right. trials after the fact defined what were war crimes. And then right. punish people for that. But you know what I'm uh, saying. I think war is sort of uh, life in a nutshell, upping the stakes a little bit. And I just think it's a great uh, template for like moral ambiguity because the stakes are so high. What would you do to survive? Uh, speaking of the dude with the f funky mustache, <laughs> I've, I've often said, you know what? I would die for my principles. I wouldn't sell out. But who really knows? Well, you know, and, and you bring it back back to you know the examples that we were, of course, given how both those histories are of Hitler. If you think about it, I mean, the first one you re read, and of course, you know, I know Dominic, you were like, wow, he sounds like a great guy, even though you knew no, who it kidding. was. You know, I don't know. I'm saying, but I know you were saying that, you know, in a joke. <laughs> but the reality is, if you think about it, if you were a, and I'm German, that's my heritage, but um, I have that too. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm one of my breeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I think of like my my ancestors that are from there that came to the U.S. and actually had family who fought family, you know, German relatives who fought World War II against German relatives who were Nazis. Anyways, thinking about that is I and I had a few foreign exchange students who are from Germany um, and I remember talking to them. I mean, if you lived in Germany at the time and you heard that first perspective of who Hitler is, you know, going back to the whole perspective, I mean, a lot of that's true. Like that, th that would, of course, which is why he got so many people to support him is because, you know, you felt that way. You I mean, you saw the good that he was doing for your country, even though there was this obviously the second side of that history, mm. which you shared, which was the very adverse. Well, that's, side. that's why it took hold was yeah. the, des well, the desperation. But, well, and that's what I was going. I think that's where war, like why people use that as a backdrop is so nuanced because mm -hmm. there is both, you know, going back to like, we, I know Dominic, you and I talked about this early that you have that, you know, duality of the two sides constantly in conflict. Well, to be honest, you know, let's assume that's all true. And that, Desperation can excuse all kinds of things, right? Survival can mm -hmm. excuse making nuclear wars for living to put food on the table and roofs over heads, and it has for generations. Yeah. But let's say we can rationalize anything under the guise of survival. Yeah. Uh, that's why I wrote my book, is so that we can parse the stories that we're internalizing by default, if that makes sense. So I would say in this moment, 
very few people look to history to understand, you know what, demagogues have always been fear mongers. Demagogues have always used the tribal instinct to demonize the other to find a scapegoat. You know, and people just are really blissfully ignorant to the handbook that, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The dude with the mustache directly handed to the orange asshole. Like, <laughs> uh, come on already. So I, I just hope we can get a little smarter about these mythologies we're talking about, these national identities we create through narrative, and begin to just, you know, be a little more discerning about what we internalize. You talk about national identities created through narratives, and, and you know, that, that relates to the notion of foundational fictions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Doris Summer has, has a really good book on that about the in Latin America, she talks specifically about Argentina and um, the, the way in which the national identity was consciously created mm -hmm. by the, the people in political power at the time, you know, after they broke off from Spain and then they had lots of internal wars and, and they created a kind of, you know, the, the unification was a mod modern state of Argentina. It excluded um, what is now Uruguay, parts of what is now Brazil, and they ended up with with Argentina. Mm -hmm. And how are they a, a peoples distinct from the other peoples? Mm -hmm. the, those of, of, you know, they were so, Spanish before, you know, yesterday I was a Spaniard and today I'm Argentinian. <laughs> right, what makes right. me an Argentinian today? And they created mm -hmm. their, their own mythos mm -hmm. um, through works of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and Well, would that, you call that propaganda at that point, though, if it was a conscious effort or is it a byproduct it's it's both propaganda and and um you know it's like the the the, the renaissance notion of self-fashioning of of mm -hmm. you know making yep. yourself yes creating creating your own identity um well having, to tie this back to art center by the way our shared alma <laughs> mater of art center um there was a really great presentation probably 30 years ago now 25 years ago and they literally brought the Third Reich style guide. Oh Have you God. ever seen a presentation no, like that? No. And it was, you know, we like to excuse, again, a number of ills by saying, I mean, I used to catch myself saying, well, there's really nobody with a twisty mustache in a swiveling chair petting a cat here. It's just <laughs> human nature plays out, you know what I mean, according to human nature. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain, but when people say, oh, governments always use materialism to oppress the populace, I'm like, no, people are people. They're pretty shallow. <laughs> like, So I always excuse it, but it couldn't be clearer when you look at this Third Reich style guide that it was so calculated, and these things do get passed on by world leaders. It was like, use this typeface, not that one. And of course, the propaganda films, yeah, yeah that was very express if that makes sense and uh conscious but the style guide even more so again this typeface not that one i'm not going to remember everything but when you use a core shadow on a character to idealize them it must be carved out with right angles like it was so well thought out wow that would be that would be fascinating maybe wow. it'll come back this was years ago <laughs> I want to say to some degree, though, when it comes to literature, to art, to everything, you know, as the person who is creating it, to some degree, I think that you, you know, you per you pick certain style choices and make certain decisions because you are trying to invoke a certain feeling. Yeah, I think propaganda and art is the line between propaganda and art is in the eye of the beholder, by the mm -hmm. way. Yeah. No, yeah. Sorry, Ted. Uh, and well, and what what I would say is that there is an intentionality um, for, for what I would call pure propaganda. That's somebody who knows I'm going to do this to try to influence people in this way and promote this mm -hmm. version and and not that version. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's propaganda. But not everything that can be used as propaganda have that intent coming from you know the the creator of that right of that exactly. Work. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I'm being a little bit of I'm being facetious a little bit. I mean, I'm enough of an elitist to say where I draw the line is, yes, the intent. So just I don't want to lose you, Ted. But yeah. again, big part of the book is like, even with AI, all these conversations about what constitutes the human touch in the creative process or in the product of it. I don't really care. You know, they talk so much about 
rights and intellectual property rights and using my image. I don't care about any of that. What I don't want to lose is the understanding that true inspiration in the creative process actually comes from what's needed by the universe, what's needed by collective consciousness. And I'm that romantic about it. Yeah. The lightning strike of inspiration comes because the, in the dialectic of human evolution, consciousness knows what's needed at that moment. So I do separate that. Call me an art center elitist if you want, but I separate that from, yes, a conscious decision to, like you said, promote one narrative over another for an end cause, whether that end result is the almighty dollar or political alignment, that sort of thing, or persuading the masses, there's a distinct difference. Right. That's what I would say. I mean, as as an artist, you can have that lightning strike that you just talked about, that, that, that bolt of insight <laughs> that comes to you, you're inspired, you're going to do this. Um, and it may or may not be a useful tool for somebody mm -hmm. else. Um, but that's very different than saying, okay, this is my end objective. Right. So I right. want to create something to get to that objective. So now I'm going to figure out how do I create right. this, this painting, this sculpture, mm -hmm. this, this novel, whatever I'm going to create to, to get to that specific objective. And, right. and, and for yep. me, that's the key difference. Yes. Well, some would argue though that, the Wallace model of the creative process is different than the other seven, right? And that those steps can come in different order, but that's why I call it intentionality. It's not the order the steps come in. And I also will uh, backpedal a little bit and say, I think every delusional artist thinks it was divine inspiration, right? I'm sure, I, can, I guess I'll say his name. I'm sure Hitler thought he was inspired, you know, that everybody needed his message. I'm sure, so I'm just, that's a caveat. I think every delusional artist thinks, right? Their inspiration was divine. Well, it, it's you know every every true believer thinks that this, you know, my way is the right way. Right, right. You know, and and that's that's what I want to do. There's well, and that's why going back to every particle of the universe being entangled and everything being interdependent, right? That actually, I think I say amen for the pendulum swings. It's it's a silly example, but even our two-party system it's like imagine how far off the rails we would have gone a long long time ago if we didn't at least have opposing viewpoints creating some kind of crazy balance so i do thank god for all the forces you know what i mean if one person's worldview forms because they're very charismatic forms a movement and that movement catches on and it becomes policy at some point that all of these little ripples, right, that come from an individual and become a movement, that become a policy, that become social reform, they do work together for the sole purpose, just my opinion, of propagating the effing species. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, there is value to all of it, but we're quick to judge anything that doesn't align with our own worldview. Oh, very good. It takes, very it takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of faith to say amen for all of it. Then you have to explain starving children and... Uh, Africa and things like that. Yeah. Melan Kundera has has a quote in his book Encounters. I think it was like the last thing he published. Um, but he's talking about um the absurdity of people who who believe that they themselves are truly right and that people who don't think like them uh are truly wrong. Yeah. Well, isn't that called narcissism or what would you call that? <laughs> yes. Um yeah, what is he? He what does he call it? Solipsism. I like I, I, I don't remember, but it, but it, but it was, um, you know, he so sociopathy. He, he's <laughs> well, he's talking in terms of of friendships, of of mm. of, of um, animosity and and friendship, you know. But he's talking about friends, right? Who and, and he, you know, like he he believes that he is right, his opinions. Right. Right. But then he has friends who think differently, and and yet he's aware that you know he could be wrong and and he's open to the fact that as positive as he is he still could be wrong you know and well, that's, I like, that's a I like the question would you rather be right or would you rather have peace it well, comes down to ego right it's always yeah. ego yeah i mean that's that's the huge question and and the only way i mean if we're going to talk philosophically about about you know world peace right that's what mm. every beauty contest you have to talk about <laughs> i want world peace um, right, right. but but that has to start with 
you know, denying the ego to an extent and, mm -hmm. and accepting the fact that I believe I'm 100% right, but you also believe you're 100% right, you know, and and we need to find some way to have common ground. We need to come mm -hmm. up with that commonality because otherwise we just polarize more and more. Yep. And, and, and then well, again, it just comes down to who wins the war. Right. Well, again, again, a big reason I wrote the book and a big thrust of the book is a lot of this divisiveness, right? It's really popular to say we live in a divisive time, whether or not, right, that's true is in the eye of the beholder, but certainly feels that way to me in this country. So I wrote the book to say, you know what, a lot of it's imaginary, even this right? Empiricism versus rationalism or science and faith. It's a silly false, right? They're not mutually exclusive. And if you change your perspective and semantics a little bit, there's a hell of a lot more to agree on than there is to disagree on. So again, if you start analyzing the stories you've internalized in a way, I, I take 300 pages to make this case, by the way, but by really understanding the role of narrative in the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and the stories we tell about our tribe, but also the human condition at large, if you start to really just pay attention to all of that, some of the divisiveness can dissolve away because you understand the role of, right, this narrative that's being communicated through this lens with all of its biases and prejudices versus another one. Yeah, I mean... You got me thinking about an experience I had um, as a professor. I I used a short one of my own short stories for um, a, a reading comprehension exercise. Mm -hmm. Just make sure it's an undergrad class and make sure they understand, you know, what what's being told in this story. And it was a story that I wrote. It was an experience that I had as a college student in Brazil. So, so it it was really what happened to me. Names mm -hmm. are changed to protect the guilty and all that. <laughs> um, so I I know what the story is about because it happened to me. And then I'm the one who wrote it, but the mm -hmm. students didn't know that. I I used a pseudonym for the author. Mm -hmm. Students didn't know that, but so I I know the reality, quote unquote. I know the author's intent because I'm the author, so I know what it means. <laughs> absolutely. Right, right. So I'm right. absolutely right about my interpretation of this. And this one student wrote a response to one of the questions and he was wrong and I marked him wrong. I return, <laughs> I return the papers right. and, and I always, any kind of a test, I go over it with everybody I, I, mm -hmm. I, in a classroom. A test is a learning opportunity. Uh, I understand we need to have grades and you need to have points. You need to have all that kind of stuff. Um, but most importantly, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm trying to teach. And so mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to, to teach and for students to learn. And this student, asked me why I'd taken the points off because mm -hmm. he thought he was absolutely right. Right. And I knew for a fact oh. he wasn't right because it happened to me and I'm the guy who wrote it, but I didn't right. say that. Right. I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell him that he's like, because we're looking at this work of literature. It's a separate thing. It's this short mm. story that exists over there in its right. own little vacuum. And he started to explain why he thought it meant this other thing. I hope you're mm. going to tell me you learned something from this. That's what I was thinking. Ah! So, yeah, no, I, I listened to him. I had to get over the fact that I absolutely knew what it was right, about. Right. And, and other students hadn't seen it the way he had, but he justified his interpretation. And, and I realized, oh my God. Yeah, you can read <laughs> it that way too. Okay, He's thank right. you. Thank you. He got full credit. Okay, good. Thank and the you. The whole class knew he got full credit. Okay, I, mean, I, I have to, I, I have I to wanted... jump. I have to jump in here because we were talking a moment ago about the new criticism, right? Mm -hmm. That the artist's intentions are secondary. The projections of the patron are truly where the relevance and the significance lie. Here's what I'll say. I'm not saying I have a better take on any of this than you, but I will say I try to. And we're all writers here, so maybe you'll relate. When I strive for the universal, I'm aware that the projections of the patron, I leave room for that, if that makes sense. So I know sometimes if a symbol, uh, one example is a butterfly came in and landed in one of my stories. And Madeline Lingle talks about this a lot, like, oh, I didn't want that character to die. It just kind of happened and I had to let him die. And so sometimes my strongest metaphor in a given piece comes unplanned and I just trust it and I don't analyze it and I just make sure to foreshadow it and bring it back. And anyway, this butterfly came in and landed and 
It wasn't the old cliche of transformation. It turned out to be something entirely different, but I trusted it. But I guess what I'm saying is my most rewarding experiences in getting feedback are when I hear from audiences, for example, one of my films, the diamond was supposed to be truth, beauty, redemption, freedom, any number of things. But I trusted, do you know what I mean? That it was a strong enough archetype that it would transcend the projections of the patron. I read, we had a little guest book at the premiere and people wrote, oh man, I was so cathartic when she lifted up that diamond that was supposed to be left as a tip because I read it as dot, dot, dot. They hit on all of them. Truth, beauty, redemption, the yeah. meaning in life, freedom, all of it. Redemp I say redemption. And I was like, holy crap, I, I, I couldn't have felt better that, do you know what I mean? I trusted that archetype and it, I loved the projections. To this day, my sister uses one of my stories in her humanities class. And probably like you, you know, they're supposed to be looking for the micro and the macro and identifying the character arc and the story arc and the inherent themes in that, the resolution of the conflict and how it results in that theme. There's some pretty technical stuff they're meant to look for, but every term she gives me the feedback. And this is a piece that was published. So I feel like, yeah, it's got to have some merit, you know, yeah. and uh, I just look forward to their interpretations because it's always right in line with what I intended, but something unexpected. I, I would never would have worded it that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, I thrive it, on that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It's, it's a great situation. There's, I was at a conference um, years ago at UCSB and, um, Jose Saramago, he Nobel laureate from Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, was there, and he had just published a book called Luano da Morte Ricardo Reis, The Year of the Death of Ricardo Reyes. And so there was a early first half 20th century, uh, a Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa, who wrote in what he called heteronyms. It wasn't, they weren't pseudonyms. They were in different voices. He created completely different personae. And he published in, in the early days of his career, um, the reading audience and, and the literary world actually thought these were all different physical human beings. Mm. They had different backgrounds, different ages, different styles. So he had all of, of these different voices that came from him. And he, and he published it like that. Um, <clears throat> One of the characters he created, it's, it's easiest to think of them as if they're characters in a play or, or, or you know, in, in a, a film. One of them got sent into exile, went off to Brazil, Ricardo Reyes. And then when when the physical person, Fernando Pessoa, died, the, the kind of joke was it wasn't one person who died. It was all of these people who died, except for Ricardo, because he's in <laughs> Brazil. And, <laughs> and so fast forward many decades and you and you have uh Saramago who was a cantankerous frowning grumpy old man at the time he he wrote this book and published it where in which he takes those characters that Pessoa all those heteronyms and he puts them together in in a very ironic way um and creates his novel um and so the, he was the keynote speaker at the conference, talking about his book that had just come out, and and he's he's explaining, um, talking about Fernando Pessoa or, or Ricardo Reyes or, or or you know the other Alberto Caed or all the different heteronyms, but sometimes he's talking about like Fernando, the actual person who existed, and sometimes he's talking about his his character in his novel. And so he finally had to start explaining. He's like, well, Fernando, I mean, my Fernando. <laughs> right, right. Right. is doing this and then the real yeah. fernando and then my fernando and he kept doing that lunch break mm -hmm. after lunch this poor guy a professor from somewhere is presenting a paper about sadamago's novel mm -hmm. with the author sitting smack dab center front row glaring at him this this nobel <laughs> laureate who who is not friendly and outgoing and he's just glaring at him <laughs> You know, like, oh, this poor guy. And the and the guy is trying to explain his interpretation of the novel and and you know what Sadamago is doing in this in this chapter or what he, you know what he's trying to show or what he demonstrates over. And he's saying this stuff with Sadamago staring at him. Mm -hmm. So he he starts to talk and he says that and then he stops and he looks, makes eye contact with the author, and he says, My Sadamago, 
is trying to do this, that, and the other. And the guy looks mm. like, well played. All right. Wow. You have the interpretation <laughs> of, of me. I don't have to agree with it, but. But isn't that, isn't that the copy. beauty? Right, right. I love that though. That is the beauty of art and literature is its openness to projection. I, I mean, I really do thrive on that and I have no ownership. I really, God, it sounds so romantic, doesn't it? But <laughs> all this divine stuff that comes through my fingertips, I don't claim a lot of ownership in it. So, I try to do it justice. And then I'm always blown away by the projections of the patron. And it's always, I guess I'm lucky. It's always been in alignment with my intention. I think all writers, right, have an intention. And again, Virginia, this comes up every week, right? Mm -hmm. You might serve your concept or your premise. You might serve the thematic themes and you might even have a sort of a resolution of the conflict that results in those themes. But there's always sub-levels, right? Little things that you're working out in your subconscious, right? Well, so yeah. in this case, it's like, well, every character could be thought of as an aspect of the writer's psyche. Yeah. And if you become aware of it, you can sort of exploit that. In The Seeker, Icarus, and... Um, Amateus are absolutely dual aspects of my psyche. And once I recognized that, I strengthened it. You know, one is also ego and the other is pure love. So that helped too. I'm not that prideful about the outcome, I guess, unless they absolutely hate it. <laughs> well, here's here's a thought, just because I know both of you have lived outside of the U.S. <laughs> this is going to be my little not ever living outside the U.S. thing listening to you guys talk too and, and kind of talking about you know the narrative and and how the author who creates the work you know this is where their mindset is and you know then of course you get the reader feedback or you know how they interpret it so mm. especially listening to you guys and mm. i've it definitely my mind made it more concrete that this is probably what it is um is our cultural dynamics of where we're from is also how we're going to perceive course, that literature, you know, that the artistic literary, you know, work, because I mean, you think about the U.S., I mean, we're a very individualistic, yep. you know, society, you go to somewhere where it's more of a collectivism, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. mentality, they're going to have a completely different spin on something that's written in the Western world and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Ted, yeah. do you have anything to say? I mean, everything is culturally relative on the part of the writer and the patron, right? Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think, do you account for that as well in your intention that it's, you know? Well, so when you're talking about writing and, and you know, you kind of, you, you have an audience in mind when you're writing, the putative reader. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everybody who creates something in some way envisions who this might be for mm -hmm. sometimes you might have multiple audiences in mind um you know there there could be um the brazilian author george amado uh wrote uh dona Flor and her two husbands uh gabriella clove and cinnamon a whole bunch of best-selling novels like that mm -hmm. um there a, a guy did his dissertation on the in-group humor in amado's mm -hmm. novels they're 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 jokes that I don't get, you yep. don't get, right, nobody right. else is going to get it. So he's humor writing, is the toughest. Well, but it, it, what humor. it is, he, he will take friends of his and use that name to create a character very ironically, mm -hmm. who's very different, for example, than what the person is, or create a situation, a dramatic situation that would be really funny to the real people who his, his friends he hangs out with. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the joke. Because there, there's an irony for their actual lives, but any other reader isn't going to get it because right. it's not it's not it's not a humor that's built into to the narrative itself. It's completely referential to something right. completely outside of that. And and the only way you're going to get that is if you you study his personal life and you read this guy's dissertation and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it, it was for me it was very it was eye opening too, and and I think it's interesting. So I I, I wrote a short story um, that. I, my, my best friend, um, from Harvard days, he's now a, a professor there. He's, he's a, a department chair, senior professor, endowed chair, all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's referencing things that we did when we were in college together. Mm -hmm. Um, but nobody else is going to get right. that reference. Um, except, you know, I sent him a copy of it. I, I, you know, it's like here, <laughs> 
Joe, read well, it. have you ever heard the the saying that the more personal you can make a work, the more universally it will land? I, it take, I, I, takes a minute, but he, I use Tori Amos as a silly example. Like her lyrics are so obscure. You have no idea what the hell she's babbling about half the time, but it resonates. It has a truth to it. So I think, you know, I kind of operate on that level too. You know, if it's authentic, it's going to transcend. But I do think humor is culturally relative and it's the toughest one, you okay. know, to really communicate in another language. But I want to go back a little bit uh I think it'll relate to something that was said a moment ago in my book. I make a case a little bit that modern literary criticism actually has its roots in liturgy, right? So even the gospel, each book was written by a different prophet for a different readership, you know, a pagan readership or a Jewish readership. And so it absolutely, um, is considered in the writing, but also determines how it lands. So, um, I don't know what the point was other than when I write, I definitely think of readership. And sometimes I think, you know what? This is for an elite few. It's not for the masses. This is, again, the elitist in me. But sometimes I'm aware this is not going to speak to people, and that's okay. It doesn't have to. And I choose my readership, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, that that there there is an intentionality then to what you're doing when you're writing something that's for a specific limited audience. Yeah, and um, sometimes I just say, fuck them if they can't take a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, clearly the, within literature and within artistic creation in general, there, there's, you know, an infinite number of, of possible approaches to everything. And, um, and obviously sometimes the creator of a given thing has no idea how it's going to resonate, you know, yeah, you can't always later. I mean, it, yep. ideally, you know, we all if, if we're writers, we want to be Shakespeare, who hundreds of years later, people are still reading and debating and, and making adaptations, you mm -hmm. know, making a West Side mm -hmm. story or whatever that that still makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, yeah, you know. well, I Don Hahn, the producer of Lion King when I was at Disney and a lot of the big ones, Aladdin, we interviewed him at CTN. And of course, I knew he would be passionate about the role of storytelling and culture, but I didn't know what degree, to what degree. He was awesome. He gave us some really good sound bites. And one of the things he said was, um, eh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> this happens from, it's our second episode today. I'm kind of burnt out. <laughs> what were we just talking about? Oh, he was, yeah, he was saying a lot. He'll get the question a lot. Well, why did you redo dot, dot, dot? And I'm not talking about the live action remakes of our classics necessarily, but like even Beauty and the Beast, he's gotten the question a lot. Why would you even bother retelling Beauty and the Beast? And his answer was because we hadn't, it hadn't been told in the nineties yet. And I said, are you talking about universal themes landing because you've changed up the setting for, to give it more relevance to modern audiences, for example? And he said, yes, all of that. He said, when we made Lion King, Apartheid had just crumbled. Do you know what I mean? It was a very, it was all about the new landscape and the new possibilities versus sort of duty. You know what I mean? And so he said, if we retold that now, it would take on a whole new relevance. I have another question. It seems like we're hinting at cultural relativity quite a bit. And I think in your prompts, you mentioned a little bit about I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of how, you know, when colonization takes place, right, you can either assimilate the existing cultures or you can wipe them out and erase them and silence them. I think you've talked about that fine line between maybe forging a new cultural identity with your oppressors or your colonizers. So I want to ask you this, and I actually wrote it down. I just so make sure I word it correctly. So we've kind of talked about how we're all products of the stories we've internalized and even those we tell about ourselves, right? Whether the source is internalized negative messaging from your home life or the status quo through socialization, we do internalize stories. And then collectively, we've talked about how society is the amalgamation of all the stories a given tribe tells about itself or human beings have told about ourselves since the dawn of time. Assuming we have the power to swap out those lenses, you know, especially the ones that limit our capacity and potential. So if you believe in epigenetics and you believe the stories we're telling, we can make them more productive, right? So we aid in the march toward human potential. If you, if you agree with any of that, 
I guess what I want to ask you is this. Both of you, have you noticed a trend, and I have, toward what I call aspirational storytelling? It's not a whitewashing of the past, and it's not necessarily revisionist history, but I notice a lot of sort of playing fast and loose with history, and I wonder if there's any kind of responsibility that comes with that. So I've got some examples that I'll get to, but does that click immediately, like aspirational storytelling that plays kind of fast and loose with history? Um, maybe I'll ask you for your example before, okay. before I answer, because I I'm thinking of things offhand, um, but I want I want to know what what you mean. What examples are you going yeah. to be Well, I think you would agree, even, you know, it's not even a political issue, but I notice on both sides, you have this idea of revisionist history or whitewashing. I mean, I think it's fair to say, it's not controversial to say that the right would like to sanitize the way we teach history in schools, clean it up a little bit, right? And then I think maybe the left wants to use revisionist history to call the jellyfish, the fucking sea jelly now, right? Like we're really correcting our language in a lot of areas and I'll leave it at that. But the aspiration, the examples I have of aspirational storytelling and it's cinema, unfortunately, but have either of you seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? It's Quentin oh. Tarantino. Oh, yeah. No? that That's an amazing, so I- Hold on. I... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, that when when it came out, my first reaction as somebody who who you know lived through that mm. that very dark episode, mm -hmm. um, I thought, how how could he make a movie about this? Thank how you. horrible Thank for you. for you know everybody involved. Um, how dare he? You know, and, mm -hmm. and and then I was disturbed watching the movie, the portrayals of the people, and it seemed so so you know it's ridiculous. And I think, I mean this. We're looking at Sharon Tate. She's going to be brutally exactly. massacred. You know, and, exactly. and I, I was so disturbed by the whole thing. It took a long time for me to actually watch it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized this is the fairy tale version. That's why it's right. once upon a right. time that he completely inverted mm -hmm. the reality of, of what had happened. So did it win you up. did it win you over? I I thought the mechanism was really interesting. And and it made me then have to think when I when I realized when finally the light bulb went off and I realized you know this is a Hollywood Hollywood fantasy version mm -hmm. of, of of history right but to what end well that's my that, question that's what I that's I don't know okay I, then I, let me give I, you I my suspect, let me give you a couple examples but, and maybe you'll connect the dots that I'm but, trying but, to but, make. But, but, let me just say that I I suspect for like my kids who saw it mm -hmm. uh, one of my sons loves Tarantino. Mm -hmm. um, for them who were not familiar with the history, it was they they missed the fact that it was whitewashed, that it was changed, that they, right. And and I think that's a disservice. Thank you. To, well, to look, I, I don't have a strong stance on this. I'm asking sincerely. And Virginia, did you see or did either of you see once? A, no, I just said that. Yeah. Did you, either of you see the Netflix series um, Hollywood? It was about Scotty Bowers. I don't know if you know yeah. Scotty. Anyway, I actually met him in my neighborhood. He was the Hollywood um, gigolo. I guess he had a gas station and he catered to, you name it, you name it, Vivian Lee and all, you know, Catherine Hepburn. And he was dismissed for a long time. But now that most of the guilty have passed, he's been exonerated and people are giving him a lot of credence. So anyway, he ran a little gas station. He had male hustlers and he catered to a Hollywood clientele. Anyway, it's it was a Netflix series, and you're watching it going, well, this is clearly a what if. You know, that's why I call it aspirational. What if there was no racism in early Hollywood? What if, and I mentioned him a minute ago, Rock Hudson was free to be who he was. Uh, so it it is uncomfortable for me. I liked Tarantino, let me say. I loved Pulp Fiction. I thought it was genius, but he's hit and miss for me. So when he does like the grindhouse films, it's like, okay, you're really good at mimicking a genre stylistically, but that doesn't hold my attention. You got to be saying something. So he's hit and miss for me. What I will say is when you, so when he did Inglorious Bastards, again, maybe I'm uptight, but I thought, you know, I like when Mel Gibson plays kind of ridicules Hitler because he's got a horse in the race and it's not appropriation, if that makes sense. I loved that. But somehow when Tarantino did it, I thought, eh, 
do we get to play fast and loose with history? It seems too sacred to me, and I'm not even Jewish. You know what I mean? So I was uncomfortable with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood only because, yes, Sharon Tate died with an embryo in her or whatever, with a yeah, yeah. fetus inside of her. So it just seemed a little too sacred for me to mess with. And I just wonder, because one of your prompts was about the relationship between narrative and history, if you feel like over time, we're actually evolving these narratives to a point where the cautionary tale might get lost or sort of the value might get lost. Um, <laughs> not, not trying to get political, but like the one thing that went through my mind when you're talking about that is the 1619 project that I know became really huge, especially um, I want to say what did I think it came out during the COVID lockdowns. What is, I'm sorry. What is that? The, the, 16, a... the 1619 project. So it's basically, um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to say where my political stance on it, but it's my, my thing, this is my thing with it. Okay. So the 1619 project, which is of course, Jamestown, which is the slavery storyline. So it's kind of, I don't want to say it's rewriting American history, but it's focusing more on the negative side of history because of Jamestown. Of course, that's the South area and slavery and all of that. And obviously horrible, but it started to overshadow the fact that in, um, the, the, you know, Plymouth rock, which is the 1776, which, you know, kind of speaks more to <laughs> some other stuff. So, um, where I'm going with that is both are relevant, but everybody's like focusing more on Jamestown versus like Plymouth and like how the trajectory of how each colony viewed coming to the new world, mm -hmm. you know, one a little bit in more of a positive light with more obviously was, right. was more oppressive and negative. And so when I see that kind of stuff happening, that bothers me because I think both are relative. It, it kind of goes back mm -hmm. to like, you know, Ted, how you're sharing, like, the two stories of Hitler, like they're both mm. important. You can't just focus on one versus the other. You need to tell both. Mm. And that's what I think is kind of the problem when I see whitewash. I mean, I mean, let's, let's just talk about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, we all know like in which the is a story. Well, yeah, the Oompa Loompas, the fact Problematic. that um, uh, a, glu a gooseness, you can't, you know, he, he literally in there, they call him fat. And it's like, that's all being taken out of literature. And it's like, but that's yeah. how, you know sorry we, we're gonna do a whole episode right yeah. we've talked about this we're yeah, gonna do so, a whole episode. but that's that's so when you talk about that's why i'm like now going from more of an actual historical thing that's going on with our starting of our country to more of the fictional mm -hmm. side i mean they're doing it with they did it with mark twain's stuff you know they've kind of cleaned it up to me i feel like when you do that i, I see it as a way of erasing history and i and yep because it doesn't matter if you're on the left right in between whatever i don't care the point is is at that time when those stories were written it speaks to how people viewed the world at that time right. and even if it's offensive now we learn from that and if you erase it you take it away how do you learn right you know and that's why i'm going back yeah, to like you know, tom sawyer is the best example of that yeah, exactly. go, go ahead ted I, I have something to say of course but i want to yeah. hear you know i was just going to say that a work of, of literature is a, is a historical artifact mm -hmm. um it, it's a product of of you know the culture and the time in which it was created any any right, of art. right. and to to edit and whitewash and erase mm -hmm. what was in that work is denying what the the historical moment was if there's something problematic in it that should be looked at in the as a cautionary day, tale uh, right a through a modern tale. lens right um and I go, we were talking about gone with the wind before yep. I, yeah. I think it's important to look at a work like that and see what's disturbing what's not disturbing what are the multiple narratives that you can extract yes. from that one work mm -hmm. so here's one for you because this is like one of my favorite movies um and I know Bean Crosby kind of has issues as a personal person, but putting that aside, so I love the movie Holiday Inn. I actually like a lot of Bean Crosby movies, but like White Christmas and Holiday Inn are my two favorite movies. And Holiday Inn, we all know that it talks about the different patriotic holidays of the U.S. And one of them, of course, is about Abraham Lincoln. And he comes out in blackface in that. They now edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, a lot of the Disney films, right? Mm -hmm. they, the Tar Babies, Song of mm -hmm. the South, yeah. kind of get put in the vault. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, but that's a part of, I mean, as, as horrible as it is now to look back and we know that, mm -hmm. it is something that 
we learn from, you know? And yep. so uh, to me, it's like, you're taking away the fact, like, that's how they view things. That doesn't make it okay, but that's how things were done back then. And we've, it, it, to me, I feel like it also takes away our, mile, our, our milestone markers of look how far we've come. Right, right. So what do you guys think about trigger warnings? You know, in, in in academia, it's very common to say, well, we're going to show that film, for example, and include the blackface scene. But, you know, we're going to give you this warning in advance. And, and if you're uncomfortable, then, you know, we have an alternative assignment or things like that. What do you think about that? <laughs> that doesn't bother me. And and so bringing up World War II, the Holocaust, um, I remember my history teacher telling us the week that we were going into that, we were going to actually watch real footage out of Germany from the Nazi party where they, <laughs> it was live footage of the concentration camps. And he let us know it was going to be a trigger warning. I mean, I wanted to be there because I wanted to not miss and learn from that experience. But I had a lot of friends who weren't even Jewish who were like, I'm out of here. Well, so Ted, I, you know, the first time we spoke, I think the the first time uh, you charmed me was at a diversity and inclusion meeting. You remember? Um, I remember being in those meetings and talking to you. I don't know if that was the first time that we spoke. It could be. Well, I do feel like anyway. It was a it was a depart. It was an illustration department meeting, and it was a, a diversity and inclusion meeting. And I'll never oh, forget the one. The yeah, in in the uh, in the FDR. Maybe right? yeah, yeah 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 yes. Anyway, <laughs> you may remember then. <laughs> There's a fellow. A colleague of mine, an illustration instructor that's got a good 15 years on me. I won't say any names, but, uh, you know, we were talking about the nuances of diversity and inclusion. And he spoke up in the middle of the meeting and said, what the fuck is a microaggression? Like, not even on his radar. It was yeah. so comical. So I'm a Gen, Gen Xer, right? So... I could be part of the problem and not the solution, <laughs> but I would ask a question. I know you're not supposed to answer a question with a question, but safe space, this is like, have we gone too far with trigger warnings and safe spaces? Because at some point, will the cautionary tale be lost? So I would ask you, short of PTSD, what is the worst thing that could happen when somebody's triggered? You know what I mean? Is it actually PSD? sorry, PTSD that, that we're worrying about here or what, what's the worst that could happen? Well, one, one of the problems in, in college, post-secondary education, um, mm -hmm. we're supposed to push people out of their comfort zone. We're supposed mm -hmm. to challenge people. Especially um, at an art school when art's mm -hmm. entire role is to provoke. Go on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and so in some cases, <laughs> trigger warnings um it defeats the purpose of what a class is supposed to be um you know there i i think it's i i don't have an answer because i think i think it's a it's a tricky question sometimes but i see a lot of people where it's almost like the whitewashing you're talking about like okay we're going to make sure we we don't have anything that anybody could possibly find offensive so you know, it's all just, you know, like plain white bread with no crust. So yeah, he, I think it's ironic at an art school when yeah. art is there to provoke. Sorry, go on. Oh, I was going to say, so this is this is what goes through my mind. That I'm going to use Little Mermaid. So I'm a huge um, Grimm and Anders Christian Andersen fan. I have the complete works of both. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. So I know the real story of the Little Mermaid. And so I was excited when Disney did it, knowing it was going to be disney <laughs> you know all sun, sunshine and rainbows which is not the true story of the little mermaid because she does not marry prince eric she dies right <laughs> like she becomes right, right, right. <laughs> like, yeah it's, it's it's but and i think of like aesop fables i mean why were those stories written back then it was exactly what you guys are talking about it was to help people learn Right. You know, and not whitewash and put them in these little bubbles. And well, so, I, yeah. use, I use Pocahontas as an example, since oh, we're yeah. talking about my employer of 11 years, Disney feature animation. And I never defend Disney, but I, you know, now that we're talking about, hey, what is the responsibility that comes with sanitizing? Or I call it idealizing. Disney's brand is to idealize. And yeah. I see a lot of beauty in that, actually, you know. 
anyway, back in decades past, I think the aspirational imagery was actually a good thing in some ways. But anyway, Pocahontas, it's the same thing. She didn't marry John Smith. It was an entirely different settler that she married. She mm -hmm. was taken back to England and she died of syphilis. So I don't think that makes for a really good plush doll with Disney merchandising, you know? Well, and it's not the happily ever after, you know, ending that, you know, Disney's going for. But that's, but it's true. I think, you know, when you think about trigger warnings, I mean, I think it's important to, I think if somebody has a good reason, so going like what you're saying, Dominic, about the PTSD thing, like if, so for example, like I talked about my history class, how our professor in college was like, hey, we're going to see real footage from right. the Nazi party. And so- I could tell if like somebody was Jewish and had like, you know, a family member that they've heard the stories from who was in the concentration camps, like, absolutely. Well, that, I was very sincerely asking when it comes to transgenerational or intergenerational trauma, right. there are very real triggers, yeah, right? And it could trigger yeah. PTSD. So right. but where do we draw the line? Well, and so, that's, what was, that's what I was going to say. I think that's a real reason to be able to leave. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I had, you know, college friends, students who were not Jewish who literally didn't have, as you always like to say, a horse in the race. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, I'm out because they just didn't want to, you know, they just didn't want to see. The question is, what is the motivation for, I think we live in a litigious society. Mm -hmm. We're walking on eggshells for the wrong reasons. I think That's we, my only objection. Well, Ian, you're right. I was at Art Center from 1985. I went to Saturday High in 1985. I went there from 89 to 91. Mm-hmm. I then founded their entertainment track and taught there for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So in total, it's an over 30 year relationship with that school. I saw all the changes. I saw the reasons it changed. Mm -hmm. When I was there from 89 to 91, yes, there was one instructor that, you know, you're painting naked bodies all day, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, all bets are pretty much off, right? You're just, you're, you're there to paint naked bodies. He made the mistake in a crit of saying the two words together zucchini breast the parents got involved it was the first time you really saw parents coming to campus and getting involved now mm -hmm. right? right parents helicopter parents swoop at the mm -hmm. drop of a hat but this was the first time we ever saw it and yeah the department chair of course did not support this individual and he was booted but it's been a progression of the tail coming to wag the dog, in my opinion, if that makes sense. I agree with you. I think sometimes we worry too much about everybody's feelings, which makes it, we worry about everybody's feelings. And yeah, we go too far because everybody can say they're offended. My something. my contention is we're not worried about their feelings. We're worried about their litigious parents. Yeah. And that too. But that that is a reality. I mean, it's funny mm -hmm. you're talking about, you know, having having nude models. And we we had to deal with an issue where somebody signed up for um a, a you know a, a life drawing class uh i don't remember if it, drawing painting photography but they were not expecting nude models and, and were they triggered they, yes they were triggered. <laughs> really and, yes oh, wow which led you know the reaction for most people like this is an art school right everybody knows well mm -hmm. that person didn't know and and long story short is um we came to the conclusion that for the classes, like what used to be called um, Art Center for Teens or, or Saturday High. Saturday High. Like right. um, we've got, it's gone through several names, but <laughs> that. Um, Public programs. Those, yeah, that's another old name. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's those <laughs> kinds of classes. Okay. They, they don't have nude models and then the credit ones do. And so there's a mention of that in the, in the catalog. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, yeah, we have consent flesh, kind of flesh colored thongs. And that was way back in, like I said, 85 flesh colored thongs, which I found uh, more obscene, right? Than the beautiful naked body God gave us. I found it obscene. But anyway, that ah, nudity is neither here nor there. That's a whole nother. We can, we can talk yeah. for a long time about that too. But no, I, I do agree, Dominic, with you. I think that sometimes we do go too far because we're trying to be everything to everybody and you can't. Yeah, yeah. And again, again, I just feel like the reasons are a little skewed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's that we're litigious and we're protecting people. I mean, here's another way of looking at it, too. And it is related to the role of storytelling a little bit, right? There are crucibles in life where we are out of our comfort zone, where we are being challenged. And actually, we might have cognitive dissonance that's demanding to be sort of synthesized, Right, two opposing thought forms that are meant to be synthesized. If we start 
sanitizing life to the degree that we no longer have to resolve that cognitive dissonance, we never arrive in new territory. It's called emotional maturation and spiritual maturity, mm -hmm. right? If we, sorry, I'm, I'm preaching a little bit, but if we take, if we remove all those crucibles from our path, there's no growth to be had. So I'm not playing the Gen Xer, yeah, like, yes. oh, <laughs> like we've talked about, oh, I drank out of the hose and I haven't grown a third arm. Like, yeah. like go ahead and eat dirt. It'll, <laughs> your immune system will flourish. Like none of that. But Yes, my opinion is we've gone a bit too far and maybe there's some growth that we're being robbed of, right? When I mean, you're your parent, Ted. I have 22 nieces and nephews. I've watched them all grow up. And I'm not kidding. Art Center has started recruiting directly from high school. So I've seen the changes with each incoming generation. My generation tends to try, it's like every generation, give their kids what they didn't get. So if we were famously unparented as latchkey kids, Maybe you people, you're a little older, Ted, but maybe my brothers and sisters and peers are overparenting. You can't protect your child from everything in life. They've got to stumble and get back up. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. And as a parent, that's that's the one of the difficult decisions is is at what point do you know, do I let them make their own mistakes? Right. Uh, and what things do I want to tell them in advance? And and mm. it's an ongoing situation. Exactly. I mean, it's interesting because you know, my I have twins. They're nineteen. Um, they're in their second year of college. They, in many ways, they are legally they're adults, and <laughs> and in many ways they're they are on their own as adults. And yet, for many things, they ask our permission for stuff that mm -hmm. um, they don't have to. You know, it's not like asking. Well, they to, want they want your input, right? Well, no, more they they will literally ask for permission, which is different than input. So, input. Yeah. I was talking with my son, who's who's here right now, about housing for next year, and so that was input. He's like, I've got this option, that option, these roommates, those roommates. What you know? What do you think? That's great, and that that's a different conversation. But when oh, can I buy X? Like, do you have the money? Then you can buy it or not. Up to you. You know, like that. But they'll ask permission on some things like what that. is that? Can what I, is that? Can I take this class? Well, hmm. that's up to you. Do you want to take that class? Does it fit? You know, but so they're transitioning. And mm -hmm. and you know, it's you want to, as a parent, you want to like, oh, let me fix that for you. Right, let me do course. that for you. Let me help you because I don't want you to have to suffer on anything ever. Right. But that's not helping them if I do that for everything. Right. Because it's going to hurt them. They need to learn how to stand on their own two feet, which is I'm very glad to see that they are doing that. Um, but it's it's trickier. And and even though I mean, I'm 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 tail end of baby boom. Um, I'm, I'm a generation before you. Um, so you're the young boomer. <laughs> I, I'm a young boomer. Yeah, it's funny because yeah. my, my, when that became slang, my kids would call my wife, hey, boomer. And they would say <laughs> that to her more. And she she's not a boomer. Oh, right. Yeah. Definitely generous. I was going to say, how did that yeah. go over? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah she didn't like that. But I would say, like, hey, that's me. I'm a boomer. Have we run the numbers, Ted? I, I feel like you're my, you're my aunt's age. I have an aunt I, that's... I, I was born in 61. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say so. Like to to get perspective, so because I'm I'm a Gen, um, I'm Gen X with with uh, Dominic. I'm I, f I think I'm what nine years younger than you. I was born in I don't know. seventy five. Anyways, um, so I have a twenty seven year old. I have an eighteen year old. Um, both are gonna be twenty eight and nineteen soon, which is gonna be weird. Um, and then I have a stepmom who's literally twelve years older than me. So she was. I don't know what would that be. That'd be sixty-three is when she was born. Actually, that's my oldest sister is sixty-three, yeah. so she's two years younger than you, Ted. Yeah, yeah. So I will sit and have um, conversations with my stepmom quite a bit because I have siblings who are like fourteen and more younger than me. Like Louie, I have a brother and sister around my oldest child's age, and so we'll talk. And it's interesting to see the difference between her um parenting style versus mine because i'm a latchkey kid i grew up with very little supervision growing up i mean i legitimately was a latchkey kid and i can tell like i have to be better about not doing the helicopter thing because like for example my oldest is 27 going on 28 hasn't lived in my house for six years and will still like hey is it okay if i do this i'm going you're almost 30 you know but i want to like give them an answer and i'm like and no, i can't give you an answer because you're almost 30. But then my soon to be 19 year old who lives in my house last night, we're all at dinner 
turns to me and is like, Hey, I'm going to put this for application to, um, so I don't, you know, cause I, I kind of want to get on my own and live in the dorm and basically be what are they, their RA or whatever mm -hmm. the, you know, people oversee like all the people yeah, on the dorm. Right. Yeah. And, uh, she wasn't asking. She was just letting us know this is what she's going to do. And all of a sudden, like her dad and I was looking at her like, well, let's talk about this. And I had to stop myself because <laughs> I'm like, she's technically an adult. She's been in college for a year under our room. And she just wants to like, this is like a safe way for her to kind of get out on her own, but not be too far from home yeah. and not have that added expense. Cause obviously she gets room board for free. And I'm going, okay, don't, don't do it. Don't tell her. Well, no. <laughs> So yeah, it's kind of interesting how that happens. Well, I, I hope there's a parallel here because <laughs> I think this is the definition of a tangent, but it seems a little reflective of, like we said, the climate of uh, mm -hmm. trying to protect ourselves from everything all the time. So yeah, no, find a graceful way to trace that back to story. Uh, <laughs> well, the story is, is, you know, like talking about the parenting and just, you know, how we're talking about, you know, trigger warnings and stuff like that's the same thing when we're like, even as writers, you know, or someone who's a script writer or. A yeah, that's the episode we've talked about doing is like the walking on eggshells thing. We tend to start to, I think, internally censor ourselves because we're. Yeah, I think comedy, like comedy is the most pronounced mm -hmm. genre and format in which the art suffers. When you have to walk on eggshells in comedy, it just falls flat. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank God I'm not out to please all the people all the time. And I hope, you know, the pendulum swings too. I think mm -hmm. we're rec most people are recognizing it's gone too far. And what goes out with the bathwater, right? Nuance. I'm going to write a whole book about nuance. Remember nuance? Yeah. <laughs> Everything gets forced into some binary category that's often political. You remember during the pandemic, Q-tip, somehow they politicized a Q-tip? I don't remember I don't how remember that. I, I wrote it down. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't remember yeah. what it I was like. That's that's it. That's the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, here's one. Let's talk about, you know, the mask. I mean, you think about it, like in, in a lot of Asian cultures, when they're sick, that's been something they've done for years. Yeah. And right. then all of a sudden, when people were told, like, you must wear a mask, it was like, you're taking away my rights. I'm going, wait, what? Mm. <laughs> like, okay, you're getting a little, and I mean, you know, obviously the vice versa would be said, but you get my point, like. Because culturally, we weren't, it wasn't something we were used to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we read it as socially awkward. I, I have a neighbor yeah. that spent time in Japan, and she's right at home. She wears her mask all day, every day, and she wouldn't have it any other way. You take off your shoes when you go into her apartment. Yeah. And it seems socially awkward to us through our lens. Anyway, Ted, I feel like you, you have a lot to say. We will wrap it up very soon, but I feel like you're biting your tongue. No, actually, to be honest, I, I can hear that my wife and, and my son have come home. Uh, I figured, yeah, we should wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think we always have plenty to talk about, and there are a few things on this list I haven't even gotten to. So maybe we'll do a part B at some point. I would love that. That would that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there think... are there are many, many potential tangents that we didn't <laughs> we didn't pursue. Yes. Well, I look forward to it. I thank you so much for coming on. We really did just dip the toe in the water of historical fiction. And then the foundational fiction. Exactly. Foundational fiction. I think there's an episode there. Yeah, that would that would be great. Yeah. Let's let's connect on that. I, I would love to come back. It's um, it's a pleasure to talk with both of you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank and, you so much. Yeah. And we'll do more exercises next time, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I like that. I think it helped us kind of get our juices fun and starting to think about things in new ways, which yeah. goes back to um which is another thing we could obviously come back to because I know we kind of touched on it, but earlier in the green room, Ted, when Ted and I were talking, um, you know, the whole confirmation bias about, you know, going back to the art center that when you have so many, and, and again, of course, you know, trigger warnings and worrying too much about safe spaces that we get that confirmation bias. Cause we were kind of talking about that a little bit in the green room before yeah. we got started in the episode. And I think that all kind of, I, I'm not, we will, we will wrap up, but I'm yeah. not sure I quite follow that. So trigger, Safe spaces and trigger warnings confirm biases in well, some way? Well, I'm just way. saying it all kind of ties in. You can kind of look at all that where you start getting a lot of like- Oh, like people. you live in a bubble if yeah, you're being you protected live in a from Yeah, right. so therefore you start going into that confirmation bias kind right. of mentality. Yeah. Yep. We'll yeah. fix it all. We'll f yeah. The podcast and the book, we're going to fix it all. <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, to thank you so much, Ted. Do so. We have. Do you have any links? Do you have anything you want to promote? I actually didn't realize uh, that you were a writer to that degree. Um, well, so, so I I have not published any work of fiction for many many decades. Um, it's you know when I have some free time, I try to write some stuff, and you know I'm I'm getting to the age where uh, retirement shouldn't be too far in the future. Um, I have to deal with kids in college and stuff first, but then, then I, I want to focus on that. That's what I want to dedicate my time to. Man, I support you in that a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. sounds like heaven. Oh, it, it would be great. So I have, I'm just gradually amassing things that at some point, you know, I share with some friends and then at some point I want to try to see about, you know, publishing and doing more and all that. But right now I've got, I, you know, got to pay the bills. Got, got to do. <laughs> it's a common problem. Yeah. Yes. Well, we thank you for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I do, I, I would love to to do this again. So you'll be a regular. We'll be in <laughs> touch. And, you know, my wife can, can, can attest to the fact that I can talk for <laughs> about almost anything. We depend on that. We, nice. I've actually said my sister, you remember Virginia, mm -hmm. I said, you are our best guest because you're a great, combination of expertise but accessible right and then um just profound insights but above all a conversationalist you know yes. it's no fun to pull teeth so thank i thank god ted you're awesome well thank you uh, okay this, and it's been so much fun yeah. all right we'll talk soon and to our listeners thank you for tuning in and remember life is story and we can get our hands in the clay individually and collectively, we can write our own story. Take care.